to continue on the subject, but I'm diverting because I have winded up on what I, I've been teaching. Today I'm not going to touch so much on the tithing and the offering, but I, I'm going to touch on what kind of a human being you're supposed to be as a steward. Where does God desire you or require you to be? And uh, a corporate spirit that produces Timothy. In stewardship, there's a couple things that we see. There must be what we call a corporate spirit. And how does this, I want to, I'm going, I want us to look at different versions so that you understand how it all goes. Um, let's open our Bibles in the book of uh, 1 Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. 1 Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Philippians. Oh, I was collecting. When we're driving, <laughs> and uh, if I'm not driving well, or oh, she's panicking, she always stays. I said, I'm driving, don't worry. She says, I have a backseat driver's license to control on how you drive. <laughs> I've been telling her, I said, I find that. <laughs> let's, let's bow our heads and pray. <clears throat> Precious Savior, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. We magnify your holy name because you are worthy of it, oh God. Lord, I pray that today the words that our minister, God, will touch the hearts of our people. That even when we go home, oh God, we'll be able to recognize that we have been in your very presence. We bless your name. We exalt you because you are a wonderful Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> the Bible says, whatever happens, conduct, conduct yourselves in the manner where of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in the manner where of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the, in the one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. <clears throat> now this is one vision. The New Living Translation says this one. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. This one says conduct yourself yourselves in the manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. But the NIV says, above all, you must live as the citizens of heaven, conducting yourself in the manner worthy of the good news about Christ, conducting in the manner that is worthy in the good news about Christ. Then he goes where he finally before, <coughs> I will know that you are standing together with one spirit. Now, I'm making some comparisons because I want you to understand. He says, I know that you're standing together in one spirit, and one purpose, fighting together. And that's the key word there that I'm looking. Fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. What does God want us to do? Is to fight for the good news. Then, when you go again, you know, to English Standard Version, I want to show you different versions so that you can understand. We're going to dwell on this subject today. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Only let the manner of your life be worthy of the what? Gospel. gospel. Let's go from where I started. The first version says, whatever happens, con conduct yourselves in the manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. The NIV says, above all, you must live as citizens of what? Heaven. So that make, puts us that here on earth, we are just privileged. We are moving forward. We don't belong here. Nobody is going to be here forever. This is a, a temporary place for us to be here. Then the English 
Standard Version says, Honor let your manner of life be whether over what? The gospel of Christ. Then the other version says, The only thing that matters is that you continue to live as good citizens in the manner worthy of the gospel of Messiah. So God, when he was looking at or speaking, Paul, when he was speaking to the church here in Philippines, he was encouraging them to understand who they are, that on the face of the earth we are privileged, but where we are going, we are going to be citizens. We don't need any passport, but the passport that we need is how we conduct ourselves. Then he goes also where it says, leave us citizens who refer to the good news about Christ. So when we are walking around in the streets of when people they see you in your working places, what does people see when they look at you? Do they see you as an ambassador of Jesus Christ? Or they see you as one of the people, the heathens, that are in the streets? You know, would you just turn around when you hear the things that are going on? Like today there's going to be football and everybody's so pumped up with New England and Patriots. In fact, the ESPN, they are all here in Bethel. And uh, it's just a good thing going on. We, we all pumped up and people today, they are going to miss church because they want either to watch it or they hear the commentary. But in the midst of all that excitement, God is reminding us of something. Leave us citizens who reflect the good news about what? About Christ. So the first thing that he wants us is our reflection. The way how we treat ourselves, the way how we walk, the way how we talk. That's the greatest stewardship that a believer can be. What do we do when we are at work, when nobody is seeing us, when nobody is talking to us? How are we going to, to be a testimony of Jesus Christ? How are the people going to look at us to say those are men or women of God? You know, the most test that a, a believer has is not when you're around people, it's when you're around when it's not when you're around people who knows you, it's when you're around people who doesn't know you. Because people who knows you, you are always conscious in the way how you're going to act and conduct yourself. But when you're around people who doesn't know you, that's where the test of a true child of God. What the people say in your working place, wherever you are, that say there's something that is unique and different about that man or that woman. There's something that I need to learn. I don't know. He hasn't told me about Jesus Christ. He hasn't said who he is, whether he's a Christian or Muslim or Baha'i faith or whatever the religion. But there's just something that draws me close to them. How many have heard something like that before? Mm -hmm. That it's important when people they look at you, someone who is inside you, who is Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, should draw them close to you. Now, when you look at these things that Paul was speaking, number one was their conversation. If you look in the same chapter, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, you know, he speaks, let your conversation be. He was encouraging them to say, your conversation, what you speak, must be so godly, must be so righteous, must be so holy. And I've testified several times how I was literally indicted without realizing I'm being indicted to become a devoted Christian and a devout Christian. I had a friend of mine, whenever he met me, he greeted me and he said some scriptures. And because he kept on doing things like that, it get, kept on challenging me because I was illiterate. I didn't know much about the Word of God. So I started thinking to myself, I really needed to study the Word of God because when I meet that brother, he always challenges me with the word of God. And I will hear when he speaks about the word of God, he will cut some scripture. And he will go so detail like, in the Bible, in the book of Matthew says this and that, brother Shemenda, this is what we need to do. And nothing. So I will say, well, this is what I heard. Then he will go. In Genesis, the Bible says this. And he will go on, begin to say things about the word of God. And myself, I'll tell him what I heard. I said, well, I heard someone say this and that. Then you again caught in the book of Revelation these days that we are living. 
And without realizing, this brother was pushing me to go and study the word of God. Because I knew that when I meet him, I don't want to be so illiterate. There are so many ways how we can begin to know the things of God. And by the time when I could meet this brother, I was memorizing the scriptures. I would be at my working place, I memorized the scripture, and my life was drawing closer and closer to God. My walk with God was changing. My conversation was changing. The things that I was doing. In the Bible here, one of the things that Paul is saying to the Philippines, he says, let your walk, walk as the citizen. Walk as the citizen. What he was he talking about when he was saying walk as the citizen. The citizen of heaven. The state, the, the heavenly state. You know, when you're in heaven, all what you're going to see is joy. There will be no tears, there will be no mourning, there will be no crying, there will be no suffering. But everything that we shall see there is the praise of God. We shall be glorifying God, we shall be praising Him, we shall be adoring His name, we will be honoring Him. So it's important for us as believers right now to be in that state, wherever we are, whatever we do, to draw nigh and closer to God. And to simply say, Lord, in my heart, in my state, you know, I just want to make sure that everything that I do reflects who Jesus Christ is. Which is the most difficult part. Because the difficult part is that when the rubber meets the road and the world tries to test you, sometimes we're not so much dead. We'll say, okay, let me just prove that I'm able to do something. But you know, God, Jesus Christ was able to stand on the cross and simply say, no matter what happens, I'm going to surrender myself to the Lord. I'm going to dedicate myself to the Lord. What am I encouraging you here? Paul is the words of Paul. You know that uh, we are heaven's citizenship. Our citizenship is not in America or anywhere in the world. Our citizenship is of heaven. Here we are on the pilgrimage. That's why here, you know, we age. Every day, every year, the cells of a human being come to the point whereby we are aging. But when we are in the heavens, there will be no aging. There will be no detracting. You know, there will be no gray hair coming on my head. It will be, it will be forever unhappy. You see, you know, I see myself on the pictures always, you know, me and Ruth, we laugh at home because she, saw, she shows me how small I was, and when we got married, somebody told Ruth, he says, get a hold of your husband, because he might, if someone blows him, he may be tossed around in the air. And now, you know, believe me, let, it, let the hurricanes blow me, I don't know. <laughs> you know, that means she has fed me where I'm going. All right, let the tornado come, I'll go another. So, what I'm saying is that God wants us to have that strength. God wants us to have that stamina. God wants us to recognize the goodness of God. You know, to be in the place whereby we acknowledge who we are as the children of the Most High God. Our dependence and our growth, our conversation, our life, everything that we do must reflect to who Jesus Christ is. When people they look at us, they must look at us and say, that man, he is a man of God. That woman is a woman of God. There is grace. Even in their judgment, there is grace. Even in their righteous indignation, there is grace. In their walk, there is grace. In their, you know, delivering the point, there is grace. You know, God, when you look at Jesus Christ, even when he condemned the money changer in the Bible, there was the grace of God. And when he rebuked for Peter, there was the grace of God. You could tell that there was grace because even Peter himself was provoked for repentance. Even Judas himself, there was the grace of God. So these are the things that God wants us to begin to realize. We are fellow citizens with the saints, those that have gone before us. Our life is in the heaven places. Now this is what he says in Philippians chapter 1 verse 30. He says, I see, or to see or hear, the things that we see or we hear. How does those things affect us? You as a child of God, when you look at Philippians chapter 1 verse 10, how does those things that you hear, how do they affect you? Those things that are 
are not pleasing before God? How do they affect you? You know, those things that can just come and escape you. You know, the Bible makes it very clear in Philippians chapter 1. You know, the Bible says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. To do what? To suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that and still have. What are we supposed to be happy? We still have the faith in him. We still have the love in him. We still believe that Jesus Christ is everything that I desire. And I want to tell you, if someone tells you that a Christian walk is a simple walk when you become a Christian, things are going to be easy. You're not going to face trials. You're not going to face difficulties. You're not going to face temptations. You're not going to face, you know, mockery. He lied to you. That's not the Christian life that I know. The Christian life, the closer you are to God, the closer, the more you are attracted to the devil. And the devil comes with every ounce of accusation. He throws stones at you. He accuse you. He'll call you names. He'll do everything to defeat you. So that you can say, you know, when I was in the world, I was much better. I have never suffered the way I'm suffering. Now that I'm in the Lord, everything is just changing around me. I have found out that the more I serve God, the more I have more struggles. One time I'm there praying and fasting and seeking the face of God. The other time my mind is so driven away to other things. What causes that? Paul addresses it. He says, uh, the more I serve God, I found there's war within my members. Does it mean I'm yielded to the world of sin? The Bible says, God forbid. Now, what is happening there is because whilst we're here, we're in the Adamic nature. That nature of Adam that he yielded to the things of this world. He fell in sin. And the fact that he fell in sin, and when we are born into this world, that means there is the predominance of that fallen nature. Even the Bible says this way about Jesus Christ. He says that him whom you know sin became sin in order that we should be made what? Righteous. Now, it is God that was completely holy in everything that he did, that walked circumspectly, pure, and he, he didn't consider all the things of this world. But at the same time, we see where the enemy tempted him. You know, he was tempted in the wilderness. He was tempted after fasting. Why didn't the devil come to tempt Jesus after fasting? Why did he not tempt him before he fasted? Because he wanted to see how close and how true he was to God. The devil knew that Jesus was the Son of God. The devil knew that Jesus was God the Son. He was a triune God. You know, there's God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the devil knew completely who Jesus was. And he knew that he was not going to yield to that. But also the devil saw Jesus seeking the face of the Father with the grounds that could not be uttered with the human utterance. And because of that, the devil, when he saw Jesus, when he was upon the face of the earth, that early in the morning he arose and they went in solitary confinement to seek him who was able to deliver him from all the struggles of the earth. The devil went to Jesus and they tried to find out how he could bring him down. Now, why am I bringing you to this kind of history? It's because the closer you become to God, the closer you become a target. The devil will not let you know go free because you are, you are so close to God. The devil will come and fight you viciously and accuse you, malign you, and then put you in a position where you feel like you are not a child of God. Now this is what was happening. In those days when Jesus was upon the face of the earth, he looked for sinners. This is what we have done today. We have more scribes and the Pharisees that are always accusing us. If they see you standing with a sinner, they feel you a sinner. 
If they see you standing or helping a person who is struggling, they think you are in that position. That's not a good stewardship. Let me bring you to a story that happened in the back. There was a man who was shot in stature by the name of Zacchaeus. And this man, Zacchaeus, when he heard Jesus had a come in the city where he was living, Zacchaeus decided to climb in a sycamore tree. The reason why he climbed in the sycamore tree is because he knew he was shot in the stature. But when Jesus saw him, he climbed in that sycamore tree. Zacchaeus, again, before I go any further, I want to bring you to an attention for you to understand that Zacchaeus was a famous man and he was a respected man. He was a tax collector. And the Hussein saw him, people they trembled because they knew he was coming to collect the taxes. But this is what Jesus did. When he saw Zacchaeus climbing in that sycamore tree, he called him. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. Why did he call him to come down? He says, because today I'm going to be a guest at your house. Now, what did the disciples and the people in the community say? He says, what's wrong with this man? He is a sinner. Does he not know that this man, Zacchaeus, is the most troublesome man? And this is what Jesus said. For such a person like Zacchaeus, I came for. For such a man as this, they are the people that I came for. And they said, today's salvation will be at your home. And we saw Zacchaeus, whereby he, he asked, asked Jesus. He says, Lord, I've taken things from people. I've taken things in, in, in a way man. Would you permit me or allow me to say, every wealth that I've taken from people, I return it a hundredfold. But Jesus, this is what he said. He was just interested in salvation. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. What matters is your relationship with God. How are you standing with God? How are you walking with God? How are you serving God? As we begin to know God that way, there's nothing that will move us. There's nothing that will push us. That is being a good steward in the kingdom of God. It's understanding what God wants you to do. Now, there's something that caught my mind. He speaks about one spirit. The children of God, we don't have two, three spirits. And several times we say, man, I don't understand the kind of a spirit that person has. When you say that, that person has not really accepted Jesus Christ or he doesn't know Jesus as a special saint. We only have one spirit and that's the spirit of a living God. And that spirit is the spirit of meekness. It's the spirit of holiness. It's the spirit of purity. Is the spirit that is able to identify the things of God. Is the spirit that helps us when we are going through things to fight the battle. That is the spirit that God wants us to have. And here he begins to speak to us to have one mind and that mind that propels us to be united to the soul realm that God wants us. And then as we are united so that we feed the spirit of the things of heaven. You know, and we begin to see the sphere of affection that is coming to us as the body of believers. Why? Because we are united with Jesus Christ and then what is downloaded in our spirit are the things of God. Now here's what the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 32. All the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of their possession was theirs on, but they shared everything they had. All the believers. Why did the believers do that? Because the every church realized that there was something that was at stake. What was at stake is that we need to show revelation and lift one another as the body of Christ. What does God wants us is to look at one another and say, how are we going to minister? What kind of a church are we going to be? As we are moving into the new place, I want us to be a church that will stand with the people during Thanksgiving. Those that cannot afford. Buffalo is an area that have got so many universities, even some of them, that are not very well known. But they are here. 
In those schools, there are people that are foreigners, students, that come from all different parts of the world. When it's Thanksgiving, they don't know where they're going to have their Thanksgiving. They don't know what they're going to eat. What about the body of Christ to come together? What about those that are homeless, that are in the streets, that we can show them the love of Jesus Christ? We can minister to them who Jesus is. We can reach to them and show them that we are the children of God. Sometimes it's not how much we go in the streets and tell everybody and they put on a t-shirt, I love Jesus. It's how much our action speaks more louder than the t-shirt that we put on. Amen. 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 All than the hate that we put on. I have a hate myself when I move around. You know, it says, God is good. All the time is good. And I hate someone, you know, I was in the world, why? Wagman the other day. He says, and I, I don't know whether they thought I was hearing or not. And the husband and the wife they were talking. He says, I'm going to push him a little bit. He says, he will never tell you that God is good. All the time it's good. And I'm hearing they're talking about me. So they keep on talking. He says, oh yeah. You know, he says, well, he looks like he can come on you so heavy right now. <laughs> and I have got this. Then I went to them and I said, oh, you have already pushed me. <laughs> and I said, I'm not coming on you. But then I started explaining and they started laughing. He says, because we have seen so many people with t-shirts. And the man said to me, he said, the other day I was driving and I saw someone who had a sign that was written on the car. If you love Jesus, honk. And that's what I did. He says, I honked. And it says, the man raised, opened the window, and they flipped their bed on him. <laughs> and I said, what? He says, the man opened the window, and it just went off. He said, I said, I wish he could have stopped. And I said, but that's what is written on your car. If you love Jesus, oh. <laughs> So I, I, I came to realize that, you know, most of the time, I said, maybe that was his son. It wasn't him. He says, I don't know who said it was. They should have known that there's an investment there. <laughs> Amen. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no division among you. All of you do what? Agree with one another, and there be no what? Division among you. But that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. <coughs> he and I is telling us, Start agreeing with one another. Start loving. Why is there so much dissension in the church? He said, because we speak from the mouth about the things of God, but we don't hold them in our hearts. You see, most of our people these days, what, what we say from outside is completely different to what we believe. It's completely different to the way how we can speak the things of God. <coughs> when we, we, when there's everybody who say, oh my God, how I love Jesus. It's just like the example of this couple that we're talking about, me and the white man. You know, just that, that's the clear example. You know, that people these days, they'll say things about God that they don't mean. I think God doesn't want to see dissension in the body of Christ. Now, this is the thing that always, whenever there's dissension among the believers, I think about it. One of the things that comes to my mind is that we're going to be in one place in heaven. We're all going to be yoked together. And that is supposed to be for eternity. And eternity have no beginning and no ending. When you're in one place, if you can't stand me or I can't stand you, I'll have a hard time in heaven. Because I'll see you every 